start now. Um, hello and welcome everyone to our second lecture of the Iran Colloquium. Um, my name is Madron Wardaki and I am a postdoctoral associate in the program in Iranian studies here at Yale. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Khadadad Razakhani uh, from Leiden University. Uh, we are also joined by um, Dr. Kevin van Blader, who is professor of New Eastern, um, New Eastern Languages and Civilizations here at Yale. Um, Kevin will introduce today's talk as well as moderate your questions. Um, please be sure to post your questions below in the Q&A function of this webinar. Um, all right, so without further ado, um, Kevin, the floor is all yours. Thank you, um, and welcome everybody to this uh, Iran Colloquium offered by the Yale Program in Iranian Studies. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll tell you about some upcoming talks, but today we're here to, uh, to hear a presentation by Dr. Khodadad Reza Khani. He is a global historian focusing on Central and West Asia in the first millennium of the Common Era, the author of Reorienting the Sasanians and uh, a number of other studies, uh, which I'll omit to mention here, uh, instead referring to two forthcoming volumes, one called Creating the Silk Road, Travel, Trade, and Myth-Making, and another one, Iran in the Early Medieval Period. He holds a PhD in Late Antique and Near Eastern History from UCLA, and is the recipient of numerous research awards and grants that have led him to positions in the, in, from the US to Germany, to the, to the UK, and now to the Netherlands, where he's currently a research scholar at the Leiden Institute for Area Studies at Leiden University. Um, his, his presentation today is entitled From the Last Great War of Antiquity to the Futuhat, West Asia in the Early 7th Century AD. Uh, Dr. Rezahani, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Bledel. Thank you for the invitation from you, from um, Dr. Chavis Zade, and um, thank you for Dr. Uh, Vardaki for organizing uh, and taking care of all the details of this. Um, I shall try to share my presentation. Hopefully this is now seen, is everything okay? Good. Great. All right, um, what I will talk about today is really a summary of a number of things, including modern historiography of the events of the mainly second and or third and fourth decade of the seventh century CE, their modern implications, their study of this uh, subject um, in the modern historiography, um, and then turn back a bit to history and make suggestions about how we can look at historical sources and historical events and really try to um, sort of tease a bit of information or an alternative sort of information um, against the criticisms that I bring up at the beginning and possibly come up with new um, solutions or new answers to the questions of the conquest of the Sasanian Empire. Um, what I really start with is a number of criticisms, which I might say in slightly um, uh, sarcastic ways. I hope it's not taken as a disrespect to the scholars uh, who have, to whom this is critical. I have all the respects for the scholars past and present. Um, we are indeed standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and um, it's just that, uh, I think if we put the evidence in from different points of view, we might get question, answers that are um, really answering different questions that sometimes don't come to the purview of um, all the historians, particularly the ones uh, working in the West. So part of my audience or part of the, my motivation, particularly at the beginning, as you will see, is um, towards the audience within the region that we are talking about, within the Middle East, particularly within Iran, Iraq, Central Asia and other places, and how they view this history. So I'm trying to not be a um, completely caged uh, academic within an ivory tower. Um, I, by the way, as an academic, I still am yet to see an ivory tower. I like to have an office there. 
Um, but uh, so I'm trying to be more sensitive uh, towards modern implications of this as well. And at the end, I will really end with a couple of suggestions, which are works in progress, papers that I'm working on. And I would really appreciate any comments uh, that the audience and um, others might have about those. Uh, and of course, any questions and comments on the earlier material as well. But what you towards the end, you will see that I get quite speculative. And those are the things I'm still working on and haven't finished and trying to um, figure out uh, certain things from the sources. Now, uh, this is a resume of what I'm going to go through. This is my foreshadowing. I'm going to start with a um, study of a modern understanding of the events, the end of the Sasan and the coming of Islam. I'm going to go through a historiography of the fall. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, the actual historical events surrounding the wars of the Sasanians and the conquest of the Near East, talk about the Islam's context uh, in late Sasanian period, uh, the fall of the Sasanians, the historiography of the Futuhad and their implication for what we know about them, and then come up with a couple of new proposals. Now, the first thing that I have, the modern consciousness, my attempt at making my studies relevant. I think my historian friends will all um, sort of uh, relate to that. Is this modern consciousness where I, this is not necessarily where I start, but this is where I think we can uh, have a change in public perception of the events. And this public here is the public that I mean mostly, particularly in Iran. Uh, and I think actually looking at this public could be useful for the non-Iranian Western historians as well, uh, to know that these sensitivities do exist. Um, in particularly in Iran, the Sasanian fall is seen as a national tragedy. You could see the opposite side, uh, which I'm not going to get engaged in uh, as much. Um, for example, the Iraqi um, take on the same events during the time of the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s and the propaganda of Saddam Hussein which was considered an, uh, an Arab victory, an Arab triumph, and very much racializing it in that sense as well. In Iran, in the other sense, as I will talk about, it has been racialized in the other way, in the Iranian Persian way, and has become a national trage uh, tragedy. Uh, it is seen either as a series of foreign conquests, Sasanians fall because of the foreign conquest of um, the Arabs, you know, the quote unquote Arabs, the Muslims, uh, and very much related to, by the way, particularly by the Iranian diaspora and the political exile as a ancient or um, uh, older version of what is, um, the, what is the political situation in uh, Iran today. So what you hear often about people who very much pick and choose uh, the events of the, that we are going to talk about is that the Islamic Republic is the second Arab conquest, the second Islamic conquest by the obviously people who are against it. And you know there is a whole bunch of Islamophobia involved in it, which I shall not go through. But in looking at it historically, this view of a national tragedy also gives to a very pervasive and quite a um, presence and constantly repeated theme of resistance and some sort of a stealthy survival. That um, this foreign invasion led to Iranians being oppressed uh, and um, this oppression because of the grand stance of the Iranians, because of the antiquity of the culture led to a sort of resistance, often translated in the, in the quote unquote survival of Persian I shall not go through survival of Persian other than the fact that we have an expert of it, um, Dr. Van Bladel here. I have also written a separate article about this, which is coming out hopefully, uh, which I think is a totally different matter and we have to look at it um, a few hundred years later. But it's seen as a survival. I don't agree that Persian survived. I think Persian is really the second language of Islam and things of the sort. So I'm, I'm saying that this, idea of a foreign conquest uh, results in an imagination of a very fierce resistance. And that this fierce resistance and this particularly this stealthy survival leads to a restoration of the Iranian rule, of the Iranian spirit, of the Iranian independence, particularly in, some, uh, in something that um, several decades ago, Vladimir 
uh, Minorsky called the Iranian interlude, the period between the weakening of the power of the Abbasid Caliphate in the East, uh, so after the death of the Caliph al-Mutawakkil, and uh, the coming of the, again, very racialized Turks, basically the coming of the Ghazni. So basically the study of the Buyid and the Samani. So this is, this is sort of how this entire event is seen within this narrative of the national tragedy. And this results in a sort of what I'm calling a folk historiography. What I say is folk historiography, it actually sometimes exists in official historiography, particularly in the Iranian very um, sort of nationalist historiography that I will talk about later. Uh, which tries to come up with reasons for the fall of the societies. It um, either comes up with structural decline as a reason for it, the economic uh, decline of the Sasanians. The Sasanians did not have the means to preserve their rule. Their external pressure that Byzantine wars weakened the um, Sasanian resistance. And internal weaknesses often uh, attributed to the withdrawal of the elites, particularly, um, again, a, a at least ethnicized elite of the Parthians, as um, um, several publications have pointed out. Uh, and then the last one is a religious oppression of the Zoroastrian, a sort of a Zoroastrian theocracy, which again has then becomes a basis for a modern parallel of the modern theocracy in Iran, that there was a theocracy of the Zoroastrians that led to a widespread dissatisfaction, thus facilitated the period of the fall. And then there are two approaches that take these basic structural arguments, basic things of what all these four, and look at it from a different point of view. There is an Islamophile um, side where it sees all of these problems, particularly the religious oppression of the Zoroastrians and um, structural decline in the economy and the elite activities as means for people being welcoming to Islam uh, because of his promise of freedom from oppression uh, and social equality, largely created by the Islamic leftist thinking of the 1930s to the 1970s. Um, which actually made a strong presence in the 1979 revolution in Iran. Uh, so Islam as a um, uh, sort of an equal, equalizing, uh, appealing religion, which was freeing people from the oppression of the society. And the other side of the uh, narrative, which is often very Islamophobic, um, is the nationalist narrative of, um, yes, there was a decline, there was an absolute decline because of those economic external, internal, and religious oppression um, issues, which uh, basically made people not support the Sasanian Empire. In this view, the Sasanian Empire is seen as a nation state, is seen as a modern Iran, uh, and people support for the dynasties seen as um, determining for its survival, but also blames the, the conquest as the main cause. They are violent conquests. Interestingly enough, using the same Islamic narratives, obviously, they are violent conquests, uh, which then convert the Iranian population by force and then go back to the resistance and stealthy survival argument there, which is very much um, sort of promoted by the nationalist narrative. And, and something to notice in this, um, uh, both of these approaches is that both of them assume that there is an immediate conversion, that Futuhat um, lead directly to conversion, that coming of the Arabs Muslims means that Iranians immediately become Muslim, which is a fallacy, which um, in many senses gets repeated in official historiography uh, of uh, at least 20 years ago back. Um, and since then, obviously, we have made a lot of progress. Uh, I'm just bringing two examples of books in Persian about uh, these two views. So the one on the uh, left is the Doran Soku, Two Centuries of Silence, with the subtitle, The uh, Story of the Events and Historical um, Sort of Processes of Iran in the First Two Centuries of Islam from the uh, Attacks of the Arabs to the Coming of the Tahirid Dynasty written by Abdullah Sinzarin Kub, who also wrote 
the chapter on the conquest of Iran in the Cambridge History of Iran, the standard reference, um, which very much takes that nationalist um, point of view. And then the right is Khadamat al-Mutaqabil Islam of Iran, the mutual services of Islam and Iran by Murtaza Mutahari, one of the um, really spiritual founders of the Islamic revolution, in which, interestingly enough, the basic narrative of the con conversion and so on and so forth is not denied. It's just that seen that it's a lot more um, generous and welcoming uh, view of the whole thing. Now, to just proceed. Historiography of the fall and what is happening in the Sasanian period. So a bit expansion of the previous points. Um, the basic assumption of the historiography of the fall is that the Arab Islamic conquests lead to the fall of the society, that the Islamic conquests are responsible for the fall of the society. Um, it assumes that, assumes these causes of the fall, um, and um, I'm going to go through them with a bit more detail and argue for why they don't work. The structural weakness, as I said, um, often is an economic uh, decline argument, is that the Sasanians are economically declining. A lot of times this decline is seen as basic uh, monetary, financial decline, and very simply is said that it's because of the devastations of the wars with the Byzantines, uh, so the second point as well, uh, and the emptying of the Sasanian treasury. The problem with this argument is there is no evidence for it. We actually have the evidence that Sasanians are financially quite secure. Um, in fact, whatever might have been the financial basis of the Sasanian army itself in its conquest of uh, the Byzantine territories in the two decades preceding the death of um, Khosrow II and whatever comes after it, uh, up to 636 where we have the beginning of the conquest, whatever the Sasanian basis of their wealth might have been, we also have evidence that Sasanians gained great treasures from their conquest. So I always point out to the story of, um, that is made, mentioned in Syriac sources and then later in Arabic and Persian sources of the conquest of Alexandria and all the wealth of Alexandrian uh, elite being put on uh, boats to be taken to Constantinople when they are fleeing the city a wind comes and brings all the um, boats towards the Sasanian troops who then take it and send it to uh, the Sasanian court where it is given to Yazdin, the Christian treasurer of Khosrow II, who then distributes it. So even great treasures are said to be coming to the Sasanian side. Um, and there is no evidence for a decline in finances. Plus the fact that the late Sasanian early Islamic uh, period in places such as Mesopotamia, such as Asuristan, Iraq, and in Khuzestan, and all the major urban centers, there seems to be an intense level of settlement, agricultural production, and uh, as uh, my um, uh, Dr. Fata has argued, uh, intense Sasanian mining activities actually, all around the region and including the area around the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea, and down to Yemen. So there is no actual sign of Sasanian decline. There is no, nobody is mentioning that the Sasanian treasury was um, empty, was Sasanian means of continuing the war was uh, um, uh, sort of uh, dilapidated and that there was any, any major issues. Um, then there is the external pressure itself, the Byzantine devastation of Sasanian territories. Um, particularly the campaigns of Heraclius 626-628. The campaigns as James Howard Johnston, from whom I'm getting the title of the last great war of antiquity, um, but borrowing that from him, uh, argues are indeed very successful in restoring um, Byzantine, um, Byzantines to an equal footing in the war and leading to the um, uh, removal of uh, Khosrow II, as I will talk about later. But the wars themselves, the counterattacks of um, um, Heraclius, are not wars of conquest. These are not wars that are meant to take over the territory. They are relatively minor and ephemeral in their actual territorial achievements. They are more political maneuvers 
than devastating wars that are meant to push for a result that is much more immediate. And that is particularly the coup d'etat against Hosra II, which is success. So the wars themselves are not in any way uh, devastating Sasanian territory and causing widespread destruction of places where it then might lead to some sort of a popular discontent leading to the lack of support or leading to Sasanian great loss of forces that would make them unable to withstand an external attack from the Muslims and or Arabs from the um, southern parts of Asuristan. So that second reason really doesn't set either. The internal weakness of Sasanian elite and their withdrawal from power or support for power is also not sustainable. Um, other than the entire argument of the existence of a Sasanian party and confederacy as uh, Dr. Pushariati has argued in her book uh, about um, 13 years ago, um, that the fact that those uh, elites are really not to be seen at the end of the Sasanian period, uh, that during the conquest, we do not actually see members of the great Sasanian um, elite present anywhere, even after the conquest, saying anything. We have to actually also consider that the elite that is being pointed out, the Parthian elite, are actually mostly, or all of them actually, in the northern half of the Sasanian territories. They are in the western part of the coast of Khorasan and the northern part, and, and in the coast of Adurbadagan. While almost half of the Sasanian territories is the coast of Nemrud, the southern coast, the southern um, sort of command there. Uh, ship of the Sasanians. Uh, and uh, I have um, last year I published an article in which I studied this region. Uh, and what the conclusion I reached really is that the elite of this region is small landholding, often bellicose elite, completely connected to the Sasanian family, and to the very end seems to be quite involved in Sasanian politics. So even after the events of 628 and the removal of Khosrow II, the elite continues to be very much involved in Sasanian politics. They are probably the people who are uh, appointing and removing Sasanian candidates to the throne. And in general, there is no evidence again of their withdrawal from participating in the affairs of the empire. So that's my um, argument really against that third. And the fourth point is the idea of the oppression of a Sasanian priesthood and Sasanian theocracy. Um, I really don't want to spend much time on this, maybe during the question and answer, but the simple question I have always is two things. Where are the Zoroastrian priests when the Muslims come in? We do not really have evidence of Muslims coming in and being faced by the resistance of the local priesthood. There are no local, say, Zoroastrian quote unquote bishops, whatever you want to call them, a morbid local morbid, or writing a great um, uh, even speech against the Arab conquest. Uh, we do not have the local priest being in charge of the local administration and putting up a great fight. We do not actually have any evidence of Zoroastrian priests being greatly involved in the society or in any sort of resistance while the Muslims are undertaking their conquest. And the other one is the whole idea of a Sasanian Zoroastrian theocracy, for me at least, is nonsensical. Because we are talking about Sasanian support of non-Zoroastrian um, religions. Uh, from the establishment of the Church of the East under the auspices of uh, Khosrow II in the middle of the sixth century to the fact that Khosrow II himself marries one and probably two Christian wives, has a Christian treasurer. And uh, if we believe all the tales in the Chronicle of Sa'at and the Chronicle of Khuzasan and other uh, Syriac and um, Eastern Syrian sources, uh, has um, a very influential member of the court and court's a physician in, by uh, Gabriel of Sanjar and many other people who are actually Christian. And I always propose this in semi-jokingly, but also as a point of argument that imagine that the very Catholic um, kings, Ferdinand and Isabella or 
um, Carlos the First or Philip the Second of Spain marrying a Muslim or a Jewish wife, uh, and how that would have quite sat with the uh, Inquisition and uh, the um, papal um, structure. So the idea that the late Sasanian period was a Zoroastrian theocracy just doesn't work, not only because of the absence of the priest, but also because of the fact that other, other religious uh, religions are quite present, that the support for the Christian, Eastern Christian church is actually a cornerstone of Sasanian policy in their conquest. So I, I categorically um, deny the fourth um, uh, reasoning. Um, I just want to show you these maps because I will come back to them. So this is the Sasanian Empire before uh, the wars of uh, the early 7th century. I just want you to notice that in the south, Yemen is um, contested, but finally contested with Aksum, but finally conquered from Aksum and is, becomes under the control of the Sasanian. And this is what really happens in the early 7th century. I'm not sure if the colors show, but I've tried to show the extent of Sasanian conquest, probably even more extensive than this, but I've been very um, conservative in the Egyptian front and also not really considered the conquest of the Aegean coast, although that seems to have been the case. But at least this is at least the extent of the conquest. And here again, notice that Syria, Palestine, and Egypt are completely under Sasanian control, and so is the south of Arabia, and so is the eastern side of Arabia. And what is this all in aid of? This is in aid of thinking of Islam in a Sasanian context. We are already thinking of Islam as a late antique religion. There are many studies of Islam as a late antique religion, uh, from Robert Hoyland's article on the subject, as is Al-Azma, and other people who have written uh, about Islam, its theological basis, its textual basis as a late antique religion, which is very much based on Christian uh, st studies of late antique Christianity, which are sort of assumed to be Byzantine. Um, because of this assumption that Sasanian Empire is a Zoroastrian Empire, the, uh, the connection to Christianity, which is quite real and present, uh, is seen as a sort of the evidence of a connection to the Byzantine, uh, which then begs the question of Sasanian Christianity, but not getting into the question of the actual religion, which I don't want to get to Islam as a religion. I want to get to a political geographical argument is that Islam comes to existence in a geographically Sasanian space. Is that as I showed in the map before, Sasanians in the mid sixth century have conquered the south of Arabia. During the time of Khosrow II, they are conquering Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Eastern Arabia is already has been under Sasanian control, probably as early as the rule of their founder four centuries earlier. So the only non-Sasanian connection of the early Islamic state is really Aksum Habasha, which is not a surprise because, as you see, the first Muslim embassy under the um, leadership of a nephew of Muhammad actually goes to Aksum to Habasha. Um, Sasanians are very active in the establishment of the Church of the East, which proves to be very um, influential in the interactions of the early Islamic uh, states with the Near East uh, in the sense of um, basically not only theological exchanges, but also the characters that are involved. Uh, in the period of the early Islamic, um, you know, formation of the early Islamic state. And of course, Sasanian support for Jewish elements in Himyar and Palestine also are something else that's, I guess, in, in, an, in, an, in a religious way, influenced the beginnings of Islam as well. Now, Islam itself and the wars of the Sasanian and Byzantines, we have two bits of evidence for. Uh, is that um, one of them is Surah Al-Rum, which has been interpreted in different ways uh, and based on the readings of details of Arabic and where, where you're going to uh, go, um, have, uh, uh, how to go, uh, going to read the verb, uh, is might be a um, pro-Sasanian or a pro-Roman um, 
um, sort of uh, part of the Quran, it has often been traditionally interpreted as pro-Roman, uh, but it can be supported as sort of, instead of being a prophecy, but rather a, a post facto pronouncement on the war, which would be pro-Sasanian. And also the Battle of Tabuk, which I think is important in two senses. The Battle of Tabuk happening towards the south of what is today Jordan, happening in the lifetime of Muhammad. And it's happening right after the conclusion of the uh, Sasanian Byzantine Wars. And it's motivated by at least where Islamic sources later say, like Ibn Kathir and others say, by a um, fear in, on part of Muhammad himself that the Byzantines are coming for a conquest. And I'd like to go back to this story of what the Byzantines are doing for conquest. But notice something that this battle is called the Ghuzwa. It's called the prophetic conquest, prophetic war, uh, where there is really no point of conversion of any marginal polytheistic population, but in all characteristics is a futu character, a, a battle. And this is the, one, of the, one of the issues that we have to notice that the division between Futuha and Ghuzwa during the life of Muhammad and afterwards is really a later historiographical um, imposition on the actual events on the ground. We're calling the wars during the life of Muhammad as Ghuzwa and then afterwards as Futu is something that later historiographies are actually pointing out. It's not by nature any different. They are both the nature of the wars are really the same. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting that here uh, we might see evidence of um, Islamic states reaction towards the wars that is happening further north um, and in a Sasanian context and possibly an effort in breaking out of a Sasanian gridlock that has surrounded the Islamic state. And here we could also think of the Meccan trade and the rise of Islam and reconsider it as if, if we take the suggestions that a selling of um, war material, including things such as uh, selling of um, leather was an important uh, point of the Meccan trade. This could be really at the time when Islam is happening, when Muhammad is moving from Mecca to Medina, you have to notice that at that time, uh, the Sasanians are in full charge of the Near East. Uh, and this trade might be actually supplying the Sasanians as well, which might sort of set where the Muslims are standing vis-a-vis -vis the sides of war, or not that by their own will, but ne by necessity, this is what they are um, really given. This is the hand you are dealt. And I want to sort of here be critical and point out uh, the importance of maps and how we think of history in, uh, in the sense of maps. And notice that in this map, um, the lines and the borders are showing the state of affairs really in an earlier period. They are showing very clear borders between the Sasan and uh, Byzantine empires. And they're showing really the borders before 610. I bring on this map again. I know by 636, the Sasanians are supposed to have left the Near East, but I do question the um, assumption that the Byzantine reconquest back to this was so complete. Um, there, other than the fact that Heraclius himself in 628 after the Battle of Nineveh, and after making sure of the removal of Khosrow II, actually does not continue his uh, battle and goes back to Constantinople. We don't have really evidence of, uh, for a takeover of Egypt, for example, uh, by the Byzantines. We have um, scattered evidence for the presence of Roman troops, what we call Roman troops, in the northern part of the Syrian desert but not that there was really a complete reestablishment of uh, Byzantine control. And the Battle of Tabuk again itself, 630, 631, is motivated by a 
fear of Roman incursion. Not, Muhammad actually doesn't face any Roman soldiers, in fact. So I think these maps are not really showing the state of affairs the way it is. Even two years after the death of Khosrow II, in 630, um, in probably late 630, when uh, Shahrwaraz, the Sasanian general, uh, who comes and kills Ardashir III, Khosrow's uh, grandson and second successor after uh, he died in 628, it is said that he comes back from Syria, that he and his soldiers, his troops, are stationed in Syria. And he comes back with 2,000 soldiers trying to conquer and finally conquering Tessifon. That even two years after, Sasanian troops are present in northern Syria. So this idea of the immediate reestablishment of Byzantine authority, I think, again, is based on us thinking of these things as a bit on the uh, incense of uh, modern uh, nation states and thinking that a defeat of the emperor of one side means the complete restoration of the authority of the emperor of the other side into this whole thing. And I think this map, uh, which shows the early Islamic conquests outside Arabia is very eerily similar to um, Sasanian conquests in the height of their power, say 625, when they are in charge. And I think this leads us to thinking of the conquest as a bit of a different thing. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. What happened? I'm sorry that there were two unrelated slides that somehow entered into my uh, presentation. Um, now, the historiography, the history of the count and the fall of the Sasanians. Um, the history of the fall of the Sasanians really is this. 626, 625, 626, after years of basically not trying to turn back the course of events, initially wanting to give up, uh, and then undertaking several small campaigns. Heraclius, the Roman emperor in 626, um, makes a series of strategic moves eastward um, to turn back the uh, conquests of the Sasanians. He moves towards Armenia, um, straight east, uh, and see, um, sort of seeks an alliance with the Alans, or in the sources is actually Khazars, but almost all his modern historians agree that they are uh, supposed to be the Alans. Uh, I don't quite subscribe to either of the ideas and I would be happy to elaborate in question and answer. Um, he has reached an agreement with Shah Baraz, the Sasanian general, uh, who seems to be present everywhere. If I was going to actually go through more details of this, I would have an argument about where Shah Baraz is located, but let's not go there. He um, burns the city of um, Ganzak, uh, which is a Sasanian um, sort of fire center. Um, he also has himself a religious role. Um, one of the things that um, we see like in Chronicle of Khuzestan, um, Khosrow II refers to Heraclius as the priest. Uh, this seems to be a reference to Heraclius's either extreme piety or an earlier effort to enter the service of the church. So he has, Heraclius himself has a, this religious uh, image. And of course the entire religious propaganda of Heraclius against um, the um, Sasanians and the wars has been well studied by James Howard Johnston. We have evidence like Georgia Pisidia uh, and um, also the, um, that booklet uh, Defenders of the True Cross, the Enemies and Defenders of the True Cross by Yuri Stoyanov. So that has been well studied that there's an ideological side to this as well. And it's a direct assault on Northern Asuristan. So between 628 and late 627, this is what Heraclius is doing. My suggestion here is that this is not a war of reconquest. These are political moves. One of them is that Heraclius, would, if you want to conquer something, you make sure uh, that your conquest can be sustainable. Two, if you're attacking, you make sure you always have a way of withdrawing. 
And this is the problem. If you are going straight east to Armenia from Constantinople, so taking the entire length of Anatolia and going east, it's quite easy for somebody to just go north from uh, what is today northern Syria towards the Black Sea and block your way going back and cut off your supply line. So the Heraclius not is taking a strategic um, sort of risk, he's also somehow sure of his return. And I think that is where the agreement with Shah Baras come to play, that he actually knows that he can go back. The strategic result of this is what Heraclius really is aiming and probably has already orchestrated behind the scene. And that is that there is a coup against Khosrow II in early 628. Um, there, in, on the 9th of February 628, Khosrow is removed by a conspiracy of his courtiers, headed by his son, Kavad II Shiroi. He's put on trial. We actually have the records of the trial repeated in uh, historical accounts such as al tabadi uh, And he is finally executed, particularly in the hand of um, the sons of his um, treasurer, Yazdin, the Christian treasurer, and also the son of the Paul Buspan of Nimbus, the uh, bureaucratic governor of Nimbus. So Khosrow II is removed by a violent coup. There is no particular decline that causes his fall. He is in charge and his um, troops seem to have survived and controlled the most of his conquest two years after his death. He is removed in 628 in a coup. So it becomes an empire without an empire. And I'm suggesting that here, there is an effective end of the Sasanians. Between 620 and 630, the Sasanian emperor ceases to exist as the head of the state. What continues on after this point is an internal dynastic um, uh, fight between a branch in Tessipan in Iraq, in um, Asuristan, and a branch in Istakh in Fars, where the Sasanians are actually coming from. And this whole thing leaves a huge uh, power vacuum. So I, I keep on mentioning, but this is the province of Nimbus, and I want to see you to see how this division of administration here matters and why I call it the coup of administrators. Events are happening in Tessipan, Istakh is another um, uh, center, and look at the extent of Nambuz, which probably even went and bordered the Syrian front here as well. Um, and the role of the elite of this region in this particular fall, I think is something that, again, we have to discuss. I have discussed it separately. I can't go to any more details here. And then we get to this last thing that I shall end. Um, the regular historiography of the Futuhat is that post-Muhammad, after the death of Muhammad, a set of events orchestrated from Medina, particularly under the um, sort of guidance of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, there is a double assault on Byzantine and Sasanian territories that they result in immediate setup of garrison towns, particularly Kufa and Basra, interestingly enough, both of them in Sasanian territories. Notice also that the first time that even based on this historiography, when the Islamic administration moves out of Arabia, it moves into Kufa. So it moves into somewhere in the Sasanian territories. Kufa is just outside the doors of Al-Hira, uh, the capital of the Lachmid. And this leads us to think, why are we thinking of these events as in this particular sense? which causes us to have a quick uh, review of what is happening, and particularly the presence of the Arabs in the Sasanian Byzantine Wars. These are my suggestions. This is, these last three points are where I am being speculative and I appreciate feedback on. My suggestion is that what we often see as a theater of war between the Sasanian and the Byzantine repeated in sources from the Syriac sources to the early Islamic sources, to particularly the Byzantine sources, is looking at the northern, northwestern theater of wars, which is managed really by the Sasanian generals. 
the usual course of events and the route is from Tessifon north to Nisibis and then westwards towards the, um, as you can see um, here, from going towards Nisibis, going towards Dara, Edessa, and then coming down to Antioch, coming down here, going towards Jerusalem, and then going towards Alexandria. So this is where everything is taking place. And this is something that is missing. What is happening from the south of Mesopotamia directly west across the Syrian desert from where Al-Hira is and from where Kufa and Basra would be westward. So I think the Iraqi Syrian desert frontier is important here and events such as the fact that Khosrow II removed the last Lahmid ruler from, this, uh, from the kingship of Al-Hira is important. I'm suggesting that the removal of the Lahmid ruler and putting direct Sasanian control over the Arab um, uh, population of the desert frontier creates these Arabs as Sasanian federati and eventually Sasanian mercenaries. There is in that region after the fall of the Lahmids a certain war um, power vacuum and a certain birth of warlord. We see this in the um, a tale of uh, Hani ibn Masud al-Shaybani and his role in the Battle of Bukhar, um, which seems to be evidence of the rise of these local tribal leaders on the periphery of the Sasanian um, uh, territories. And I think Sasanians are using um, these populations as their mercenaries in the war against the Byzantines. So this particular arrow is being populated by these warlords. This is where I'm going to, this is where I'm going. And after 628, 630, with the fall of the Sasanian authority and another power vacuum, now this time an imperial power vacuum, these um, mercenaries initially arrive at some sort of a local skirmish, but they immediately, those warlords are getting together and the early battles, such as the Battle of Jassar we have, and eventually even the pre, uh, the early versions or the, what, what precedes the Battle of Odyssea are showing that these warlords locally, not ruling from, not being controlled from Medina, are in fact um, um, taking control in the local sense and establishing their own authorities. And this is my proposal and I shall finish here. That these conquests, that the earliest stages of the conquest that result in the disappearance, complete disappearance of the Sasanian authority in Iraq are actually local efforts conducted by these Arab mercenaries already starting during the Sasanian Byzantine Wars. So Sasanian, by giving support to these federati and employing them as their mercenaries have helped already the conquest of southern Mesopotamia, southern uh, Mesopotamia and Syria, the desert frontier. And what happens is the fall of the Sasanian emperor really just creates an opportunity for these local tribal leaders to take over the region. And then later, we know that many of these early uh, leaders are then getting in touch with the authority in Medina and asking for leadership. Um, I'm going to just mention a little bit of a um, uh, factoid here, is that Saad, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, the commander of the Muslim, rule, uh, Muslim armies in the Battle of Qadisiyah, his previous job immediately before taking over the command is not generalship, but rather he's the tax farmer in the Eastern territories of the Muslim Caliphate in, uh, of Omar. He's actually the guy who's collecting taxes, appointed as the head of the uh, army after the, um, the battle has already formed, at, after the troops have moved out of Medina, and Omar is actually looking for a commander. The commander he finds is a tax farmer. And I think this has to do with the fact that this actually has already happened. The conquests are already happened. The territories need to be controlled. This is, this is a battle of administrators moving in and trying to control. Um, I, 
uh, have further evidence, which includes um, certain coins that show half Byzantine, half Sasanian um, uh, obverse and reverse. I shall not go there. I would like to um, sort of elaborate on them if there is an interest, but because they are for a later period and get us to the um, conquest during the time of Moawiyah and later, I with um, sort of uh, do not present them here. I have written a, and um, published about them later, but I think basically uh, these Arab tribes of the Southern Mesopotamia, Southern Syria, who, whom we see everywhere. In Ibn Atham and Kufi, we see uh, somebody called Abdul Masih al Qassani exiting Al Hira to welcome the uh, Muslim conquerors. So Al, -Qas and, and Al Ghassani from Palestine is an is in Al Hira, a Lahmid city, welcoming the Muslim conquerors, which shows that the whole old division between the Lahmids and Ghassanis, one on the west, one on the east, one under Roman rule, one under Sasanian rule, has disappeared. Now there is a united, or you know, I don't know if you want to call it just a warring wall or this state of the control of the Arabs in southern um, Mesopotamia and Syria, which then welcomes the Islamic conquest. And in later historiography, all of this is accredited, put under the um, authority of Medina as presenting a triumphant account of the nascent Islamic state and its universalist message and its universalist success. So I shall stop here. I think I have I had uh, enough uh, talk and look forward to questions. Well, thank oh, you, thank you. Uh, the whole audience and myself and the moderators here for your presentation. Uh, you've taken on a huge problem. Uh, the non-specialists here may not know um, that this is a really tough nut to crack and uh, Dr. Reza Khani is part of a generation a new generation of scholars who are zooming in to the sources very closely, the sources contemporary to this problem, and trying to avoid, as you could hear from his critical and perspicacious approach at the outset, uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, monocausal explanations for these momentous events and the demographic upheaval that would ensue. Um, it's not so long ago that even a scholar like uh, Ehsan Yarshater wrote even in this century that the cause of the end of the Sasanian kingdom was old age. The kingdom just got so old that it fell apart um, as if that's how states work like biological organisms. Um, that's just one of any number of examples of attempts to explain this shift and the end of the Sasanian state through um, single, you know, simple explanations, meaning explanations consisting only of one part. So by, by zooming in on these sources, you're able to stir up a lot of doubts uh, about these widely received accounts. And I think that can only be applauded. Um, I, I'd like to, um, we're going to hear from listeners in the Q&A, um, but I wonder if I could begin with a question, or Travis, Professor Zadeh, do you want to begin with a question? No, 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 Ke uh, please, uh, Ke Kevin, do take the uh, honors, but I'll, I'll follow in afterwards the question, okay. and then we could open it up, yeah. All right, so, um, I think of uh, Robert Hoyland's book, In God's Path, which is an account of the conquests that formed the first Islamic state, and a situation in which people known as Arabs were ruling all over the regions that you described, and you know, when he wrote that book, I mean, I remember actually talking with him about it when he was writing it and it came true when it pub was published. He said, I'm going to try to take religion out of the equation or out of the, 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 the puzzle and let's focus on troops, on economy, on government and those factors. How will the picture of the conquest look then? And much of his account is one in which there are, as you said in that last slide, there are these local affairs, right? That there are small scale conquests and that one success leads to another and there's a kind of building like a snowball effect. Um, I wonder whether you see any harmony between your account and Hoyland's account there. I completely see that. I am obviously having been in contact with Robert for the past 10 years, I'm very much influenced by um, his thinking as well. And I, I'm having worked with him on a couple of things 
uh, I think um, I, I'm very close to his mindset. I think one of the issues here is that when looking at the history of the region, um, I will use a sort of a cinema um, analogy. We have a um, camera looking at, even, even in history such as al Tabari, we have a camera that is looking at Iran from a point of view of Iran. It talks about Iranian affairs, Iranian kings, the first levels of Iranian kings, the second level of Iranian kings and everything. And then particularly in modern historiography it becomes even more, you know, when, when, when you look at your regular history of uh, Iran, for example, the camera moves to Medina or to Mecca and it starts following the troops of Islam going up because it's the, it's the, it's the force of the sources, obviously. That's what our sources say. Our sources abandon that story and start the other story from the beginning and comes. It's the history of the kings and the prophets. This becomes the history of the prophets, continuation. And I think um, what Robert is doing is obviously because of his specialism is that side of the story. Roberts is continuing the story of the rise of Islam. His concern is not Sasanian. I am, I could say that in the greater debate of the rise of Islam, I'm trying to keep the camera in Tessa. I'm trying to be a camera that is in Tessafon, looking at the events from a say, Sasanian point of view, and look at these um, local affairs, not because of how they are feeding into the rise of Islam, but rather how they are feeding into the transition and transformations in Mesopotamia. So the next level of my arguments that what, what I'm trying to write is that we have to separate the conquest of Mesopotamia from the rest conquest of the rest of the Sasanian Empire. The conquest of Mesopotamia is really a, an outcome or a continuation or part and parcel of the same thing that the Byzantine Sasanian Wars is. Conquest of Iran can be argued that it's a real conquest. It's something else, so it's something completely different. So I agree very much with Robert's point of view. I just don't move to the same location that his camera moves. My camera stays in the same. That actually does a lot to clarify for me um, the direction of your effort. Uh, let's hear now from Professor Zadeh. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Khodadad, for this really uh, illuminating and uh, thought-provoking presentation and, and the time you put into it. Um, I also just want to invite those uh, listening that you can put your questions in the q and I had uh, a very kind of technical series of questions and, a, and then a more historiographical um, kind of implications that I wanted to, to engage with. So on the technical side, um, and these are just questions that I'd, I'd love to hear your answers to. Um, Ibn Hordadbe, you know, very famously references the Marzuban of the desert uh, that levied taxes on Medina. And, yeah. uh, and then there's a series of poetry that follows. Uh, so, and, and from the poetry, we hear the, the residents uh, kind of bemoaning having to pay the haraj of Khosro. Um, and, uh, and then this was picked up by later tribes. So this is clearly in, we would imagine in the, the sixth century. Um, and so your map didn't have Medina as part of the Sasanian influence. And it's just interesting that maps kind of force us to kind of highlight things in certain areas. And what does it mean to have a, a, a city or a region in a sphere of influence or to be leveling taxes. So I'd be curious about that, that background and, and sp specifically as well with the Yemeni dimension, the Abna of force and the role that they play. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that and the connection. I just love that you're getting us to imagine uh, a Sasanian sphere of influence in the Hejaz and in uh, Arabia. So that was my kind of technical question. Then I, I'll, I'll peel back to a more historiographical question. Uh, so do you want, do you want me to answer this question? Um, okay, a personal answer to that and then a technical answer to that. The personal answer to that is, um, Kevin, I think, knows. I started as a historian of medieval Europe because I was very comfortable with being talking about medieval Europe because I just like history. I fell into being, doing historian of, uh, being a historian of Iran, doing Iranian history uh, out of the fact that I could read the language. But this with it brings on the problems of a very present Iranian universalism and Iranian exceptionalism, where an Iranian scholar is always seen as saying that everything comes from Iran. And I all the time have to distance myself from that. So sometimes I find that, that I'm scaling myself and I'm holding myself back 
because I'm afraid of people saying, oh, you are claiming everything is Iranian, which is not at all my intention. I don't think Sasanians have anything to do with certain modern Iran. They have as much to do with modern Iran as I know Merovingians have to do with Netherlands, right? They're, they're, so th this is the reason I kind of sometimes hold back. About the technical uh, answer, we have, yes, first of all, the presence of the Abna, and I think the presence of the Abna, particularly in Muhammad's um, sort of disagreement with Musaylama, and the fact that it's the Abna that killed Musaylama, and so turned the scale towards Muhammad. And generally, the, it, 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 would be in a, it, it would be hard to imagine that Yemen would not be influential in the politics of Mecca and Medina. And that the fact that Sasanians have a certain presence uh, presence in um, uh, Yemen would really make it hard to imagine that they didn't try to uh, control their affairs. My initial answer is that Mecca and Medina weren't as important as they later become, obviously. Medina certainly is not, and even if we believe the, uh, all the narratives about Mecca. So Sasanians didn't probably bother. The fact that they are in touch with it comes from, you know, tales within Islam of Muhammad's cousin actually telling the stories of the Persians and saying, see, the same way that we, you are telling the stories of Christians from the Bible, Persians have stories as well. I could tell you as well. So the awareness of the Sasanian culture in Mecca and Medina, aside from the fact that there seems to be efforts for extracting taxes. And what I'm suggesting is that Muhammad and his nascent state could not have stayed on the periphery of a world war of a Sasanian Byzantine world and just have gone about their daily affairs. I think I, I, I would be, later when I become braver, I would suggest that it would be unthinkable to think that the Muslim, early Muslim Ghuzwas are not part of the Futuhat, that Muhammad's early troops are not participating in the war somehow. I think Tabuk is a very obvious example of it, but I think Medina and Mecca too are within the sphere of influence. I just shy away from suggesting that directly because we have very little evidence for it, and I don't sure. want to get involved in that yeah. argument. Really. No, it's uh, it's very interesting. It actually in invites this larger uh, question I have as well. But I, I'm thinking uh, very concretely of the the connections between Hira and the the Hejaz, as imagined in the 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 poetry, the divan, you know, the, exactly. the whole literature that then that ensues. Uh, and there are these trade routes that are connecting. Uh, just to along the lines that you're highlighting, uh, why, why not? Um, kind of take the sources for what they say and that there are trade routes that connect Iraq and the Hejaz very early on uh, in the pre-Islamic period, certainly uh, in the lifetime of, of Muhammad. Um, and and it, it, it invites me to think about, you know, the, uh, as you, you, you put us into the, these tensions around uh, Arab tribes and, uh, and playing this kind of third rail against the, these two competing powers and the way that the um, tribal confederations could go in, in different directions and, and were, are, are certainly uh, important players here. Um, makes me think of Peter Webb's work. I'd be curious to, to, to hear your thoughts about imagining Arab identity and, and the yeah. way that itself, the process of ethnogenesis is itself unfolding in the centuries of is the Islamic era. And then on the kind of the bookend of that, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, Patricia Crona's last book, uh, uh, her, her final book on the nativist prophets, because she takes a very hard line on, on a kind of proto-nationalism that animates it. And it seems like you were speaking against that in, your, uh, in the way in which you portrayed the modern historiography. Because the way that I read her book is that there is this kind of continual resistance or that, this, that she looks at it very clearly in a post-colonial context. She even describes it as akin to the state of American slavery uh, and that this is a, a form of resistance and, um, and nativism. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts in, in response to those, uh, those two pieces of scholarship. Um, that that last uh, last thing was quite um, um, sort of disorienting because in Patricia's book, I was involved while she was writing it, and I have kind of engaged with that book while it was being written. In, in and in some senses, I very much feelings towards it, other than thoughts. Um, on Alhira's connection, uh, I think Alhira's connection is very deep uh, in uh, with the fear of revealing something that I'm writing that. Uh, I don't want to, um, I'm being here scholarly stingy. I think Alhira's connection to Medina and particularly connection to historiography of Islam, not the history of it, but how it is being written, I think is very, very tight. 
I, I here now being in the company of friends, I'm going to suggest that really one side of a forgotten story of Islamic historiography, which we are all involved with and trying to figure out how Muslims start writing history, very much has to do with the birth of his, uh, historiography in the late Sasanian period. And um, uh, the Hira connection, Hira's connection to Mecca and Medina is very central to that argument, that how they start thinking. And the only thing I would say is historiography in the late Sasanian period is local. And in medieval Iran, it's local as well. Every universal history is told from the point of view of a particular locale. And I think Hira's gaze is really the original seed of Islamic history. So I'm, I'm working on that. I will hopefully publish it soon and I will give a better answer to, um, than that. Uh, remind me of the second thing you were saying before you talk. Oh, about it was uh, uh, the kind of Peter Webb and ethnogenesis and how that's oh. like a process unfolding, which I, I would read like maybe against what Patricia Corona is doing. Uh, that suggests a kind of timeless Iranian identity or an appeal to a kind of yeah. identity, perhaps. Maybe that's a that's an overly simplistic reading of it, but the last kind of sections of it really suggest the kind of the seeds of, of what I would take to be Iranian nationalism today, uh, as she as I read it. But I, I'd yeah. love to hear you maybe clarify it for me. Yeah, I would be I would be quick about it. Having spent a few times having a coffee with Peter here in Leiden, I kind of I think I know where he's coming from. I. Generally, I, I guess it's not my specialism. I agree with the way Peter looks at certain matters of uh, um, Arab ethnogenesis uh, genesis and um, the way he gets very deeply into what we mean when we call an Arab and when this Arab becomes an identity by itself, rather something like a tribal connection, rather something like a, an elite identity, something of the sort. I agree with what Peter is saying, but that's only agreeing in a, in a distant, non-specialist way. With Patricia's idea, I, I obviously disagree with this uh, ever-present uh, Iranian you know, identity thing. My major thing, Patricia's book, was her actually introduction where she describes the fall of the Sasanians in a very modern nationalistic, the nation state sense, and considers the fall of Tessifon as the fall of the Sasanians, as if the person who's written in Neshabur even knows where Tessifon is, let alone care about who rules over the place. And this collapse of the Iranian identity and the formation of a form of resistance, which then comes out in these um, nativist um, Zoroastrianism uh, as somehow being switched on because of events like that. I disagree with that. I agree with the general idea of the existence of uh, native uh, Zoroastrianism and uh, sort of the idea of the orthodoxy and heterodoxy. I wrote a very bad article years ago about heterodoxy and orthodoxy in um, uh, Sasanian Empire. I agree with the general view that she's taking, but I think in this particular view of um, the resistance and the uh, sort of head-to-head -head opposition of the two sides of the story in the story of conquest, I disagree. I would. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so. If you don't mind, there are, there are just uh, two questions standing from the uh, non-panel audience members. And maybe we'll hear from those and Khodar, I'll give you a chance to answer these and then we'll see if there's time um, for more. So first of all, um, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, and this question came up when you were talking about the idea that Zoroastrian priests were oppressive and that this was a, a factor in the coming apart of the Sasanian kingdom. The question was, what about the oppression of Mazdakion and Manavion? Um, oh. So that is, Mazdakites and Manichaeans were not appreciated by the state, were led to think from the sources. How does, how does that match your, uh, your idea that Zoroastrian priests were not oppressive, if that's a factor? I think I, think um, I summarized the question, yeah. Yeah, I think we have to consider, we have to consider the fact that Sasanians ruled for 400 odd years, uh, that um, say that 
events that are happening, for example, um, about Manichaeans in the third century uh, could hardly really be directly relating to what is happening in the seventh century. I am not saying that there was no Zoroastrian priesthood at all ever in the Sasanian Empire. We have inscriptions from one of them who seems to bolster his own CV too many times. Mr. Um, uh, I can't believe I forgot his name. Kerdir, you're thinking of Kerdir. Kerdir, Kerdir, sorry. Mr. Kerdir, who keeps on leaving us um, inscriptions saying that he was really, really important, which he does protest too much, in my opinion. But anyway, yes, he exists. Uh, others exist. I'm not saying that they weren't there and they didn't do their best in order to give themselves uh, a position of authority. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that in the late Sasanian period, in the six, in the later half of the sixth and in the early half of the um, seventh century, we do not see this priestly oppression. The Mazdakite thing is an entire argument that we have to undertake, including the fact that the evidence we have of all of these is written by Zoroastrian priests under Islamic rule 300 years later. Uh, so same as uh, the way they are describing the Sasanian society is very idealized. I think their own fights against Mazdakism uh, is um, a bit exaggerated. And here referring to uh, the great memory of um, really the teacher of all of us, great Patricia Krona, I agree with Patricia's articles on Mazdakism saying that, for example, the first half of the, uh, the first rule of uh, Kabbalah had nothing to do with the Mazdakite revolt. And I even doubt that the second half had anything to do with the Mazdakite revolt, but that the Mazdakite revolt really was as central. It was very probably influential in formation of a Zoroastrian orthodoxy in Zoroastrianism coming up with theological points to make its own uh, religion quite clear. But that this adds up to a Zoroastrian theocracy I like to see the evidence of. So I think the burden of proof would be on the people who claim such a thing existed. Thank you, Khudadad. The second question comes from an audience member named Avi Nuri, who asks, um, I'll just read the question. So figures like Khalid bin Walid, who were both companions of the prophet in Medina and led com campaigns as far north as the Levant were fictional, correct? In other words, uh, were these no, early I figures fictional or not? No, I'm not suggesting they were fictional at all, no. Um, well, we don't know. Nobody who was born before um, there were birth certificates can be proven to have existed, but we have all the reason to believe that they did exist. I'm not suggesting they were fictional, no, in no way. I'm suggesting that their particular roles in conquests, um, something that I, because I, I, I tried to be quick, obviously I didn't point out several obvious points is that the accounts of Islamic conquest were written 250 to 300 years after the event. This would be something like we trying to write the history of, I don't know, even more than that, but let's say history of Napoleonic campaigns now based on the hearsay that we have had from our great, 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 great grandfathers. This is, the, imagine that we were doing that. These events are not written contemporaneously. And obviously, Hindsight is always 2020 20, when you write 20, 250, 300 years later from within the safety of a new system that has established itself, already has gone through its um, one of its you know, strongest stages in the late seven, eighth century, early ninth century. And then you're writing the history of the conquest. Of course, you take the facts, present them in the sense that it's more convenient and bolster the profile of certain people. Uh, again, take the Napoleonic uh, um, account. If you actually were doing it like that, probably uh, Michel Ney would have come out as the most important Napoleonic general. But if you actually read it, of course he wasn't uh, because we see him, his presence in certain uh, places in Napoleon's life. So um, I'm saying that historiography is embellished is written hundreds of years later in order to present a particularly universalist and um, salvation, the history of salvation um, of Islam in which the conquest play a central role in demonstrating 
the uh, righteousness of the message of Islam and the characters who are involved in this, aside from the fact that many of them are involved in actual um, ruling of the places and their descendants are involved in the uh, ruling of these different conquered places, they are also, because they are the companions of Prophet, have to be assigned these grand roles as people who physically spread the message of the religion. Thank you for that answer. Now, we're reaching the end of our time. There is time for one or two more questions, but before we reach that point, I want to take the opportunity to say that in this series of um, the, the Yale program in Iranian studies, Iran Colloquium, I just want to make sure to mention before some of you start slipping away that the series will move back to Wednesdays at noon. There are two more for this semester. On April 6th, a Wednesday at noon, we will hear from Nur Sobers Khan of MIT on talismanic Urdu lithographs, lithographs in the 19th century South Asia. And we will hear on April 27th from Hassan Siddiqui of the University of British Columbia about universal history in the late Mughal Empire. So do check out the website for Iranian studies at the Macmillan Center at Yale if you want to sign up for these lectures. Now, um, if, I, if I can ask one more question. Uh, in, in your presentation, um, non-specialist listeners might have the impression that the kingdom just came to an end with the death of Khosrow II. You did mention the fratricidal internal conflict that tore apart the Sasanian family. But you did not mention Yazgir III, young Yazgir III, who was elevated to the role of Shahanshah and uh, did, he didn't just disappear, right? Um, how, does that, how does his monarchy fit into your picture of collapse with the, end, with the death of Khosrow II? Um, obviously, excellent question. I don't need to say that. Um, I am trying to, as I mentioned, I think during the, the last part of my talk, I'm trying to separate uh, what is happening in Iraq than what's happening in Iran. I'm basically trying to take 642, the Battle of Nehawan, as this um, moment through which we can divide the idea of the conquest of Sasanian Empire uh, um, in real and call whatever before it as, as I said, a continuation of what's happening uh, in Syria and the conquest. Um, Yazgird, I have reasons to believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm now just suggesting it. Please take, please trust me. And I might be wrong, like all of us, I might be wrong. I don't think he ever got to testify. I don't think the man ever ruled in testify. He was elevated to the throne in Istakh, uh, and he seems to have put up his resistance inside the Iranian plateau and uh, never really gotten to Iraq. So I am separating him. I have done a bit of trying to redo the chronology of the succession of Khosrow and suggest that he's ruling probably at the same time as two kings who are in Tessaphon at the time that the Arab troops actually reached Tessaphon and conquered it. And he's not in charge at all in that region. So my short answer to that question would be in this narrative, Yazgad doesn't fit. Yazgad is a very problematic character, him being the grandson of Khosrow II is my first problem with the entire thing. And he is a very problematic character, which I don't think should be put into the narrative of the conquest of Iraq, but rather the conquest of the Iranian. Uh, so I'm dodging your question by being sort of uh, facetious about it. Well, I, I don't see it as facetious. I think it's, a, it's an interesting answer and I look forward to seeing the products of your research on this. I think we have time for just one more question and it, I'm not sure you'll take the question. Um, uh, the, and it comes from Madhu Tahari. Do you have any comments on the Saif ibn Omar narrations about the Futuhat? I know um, that's a pretty technical question. It's very technical and could I have, what do you mean which part of Saif ibn Omar's narration? Because it's not something that we can, I can answer in one, um, that it belongs to a particular line of transmission of the narratives of the conquest, I think. Uh, it should be separated than what we are generally see as the narration of the conquest. It probably is pointing out 
another theater of war further east, and I might have some relevance for the conquest of Basra, which I think is something that, again, we are neglecting. We are focused on the conquest of al Hira and the establishment of Kufa. The conflict is already sort of obvious within um, uh, the um, Baladuri's narrative of the conquest. And I think uh, Saif ibn Omar has something to say about that part of the um, uh, idea. But I, without knowing any further details exactly what you mean, and in interest of time, I'm not going to go any further. Well, at this point, I think we should call this session to a close. And uh, all of you can virtually applause if you like, or um, give a distant shout to Dr. Reza Khani from uh, who's joining us, as you know, from Leiden in the Netherlands today. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation and for answering our questions about it. We really appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much, Travis. Thank you very much, Marjan Khanum. Thank you very much, Marva Khanum, for doing this. And also online, thank you very much to Chuck Heberl uh, for being supportive. Thanks, Chuck. Good seeing you here as well. Bye-bye. <laughs>